My name is Mr. David Barnes and I'm the clinical lead for the St. Andrews Burn Centre. The purpose of this video is an introduction to minor burns. To give some advice and uh, help for those less familiar with the treatment of uh, burn injuries. This is a learning guide for those not familiar with burns or their treatment pathways. Objectives. What we would like to cover in this course is what are you looking at, what to do with it, how to refer to a specialist burn service and when to refer to a burn specialist, and then some warnings and advice to give patients. Who gets burnt? Well, burns often happen to the most vulnerable in society, perhaps those with drink or drug problems, the children or the elderly, or medical conditions, such as if they have a seizure or a collapse. It's very important, therefore, to always think about non-accidental injury and safeguarding in burns patients. Burns come in different types of shapes and sizes. Of course, prevention is always better than cure, and there have been a number of strategies over the years, including hot liquids burn like fire, and stop, drop and roll. It's very important to have the appropriate first aid for any burn injury. This should be cool or tepid running water for 20 minutes. And it's important to cool the burn and to warm the patient, make sure that they don't get too cold. Effective cooling of the burn can be effective up to two hours post the injury. The delivery of burn care is divided into uh, sections within Great Britain. These are called burn networks. These are our first aid guidelines from the London South East Burn Network available on a website. However, there are other networks such as the South West, the Northern and the Midlands Network. On the Burns Network websites you will find referral guidelines of how to refer and the criteria for referral of burn injuries. The question arises, do I debride, do I refer, or indeed, do I do both? You could debride the wound and treat it locally with no referral to the uh, burn service, apply dressings as per the guidelines, and then review as appropriate, or debride and then refer as per the guidelines, appropriately dressed as, as per the advice given. If it is too big or complex to debride, refer to the burn service. Give analgesia, put on cling film or a simple dressing, keep the patient warm and safely transferred as agreed. If you're in any doubt at all, please do speak to your local burn service for advice. In summary, the referral guidelines for our particular network are shown in this slide along with our telemedicine service. Telemedicine has transformed the, the way that we're able to view burns from a distance and be able to give advice locally. Burns can be difficult to describe. If you look at these images, it will be difficult to describe different degrees of burn over the telephone. Within the London Southeast Burn Network, for many years we have been using a system called TRIPS, this is a secure digital viewing platform that allows us not only to see the images, but also to give advice written down in the bottom of the screen. This is important as regards the governance and a record of the advice given. Please remember that when you're taking a camera to remove dressings and cling film before taking the photo. If it is out of focus on your screen, it will also be out of focus on ours and try and include as much detail as possible. It's very important to ensure that the correct details, i.e. the name or the age of the patient, are with the correct photograph. Always remember to protect the patient's dignity when taking a picture. It's very important to take a history of the burn injury. Where did it happen? Did something happen to cause the burn, such as a collapse or a fall? Is there any safeguarding concerns? What's the past medical history of the patient? 
and what's the social situation? When assessing burn injuries, we can assess the size of the burn. This can be divided into chunks, such as the rule of nines, where an arm is 9% of the total body surface area of the patient. The London Browder chart makes this more precise. Using the patient's hand, particularly for a small or a minor burn, is a very useful way of assessing the size of a burn. A patient's hand makes up about 1% of the total body surface area. Apps can also be used, and the Mersey Burn app is one that is commonly used within the UK in assessing the size of a burn. Let's look at some common ways in which burn injuries occur. This slide shows a child reaching up for a mug and here we can see the typical cascade scald which can occur when a hot drink falls onto a child. Those scalds in the bath can occur at any age group. It is most commonly in the children and particularly in the elderly. Hot objects often get to very high temperatures indeed. Irons or hair straighteners can cause very deep burns very quickly. Flash flame burns. Flashover burns often occur when people are burning rubbish. It's not unusual for the actual size of the burn to be quite small, even if people are covered in soot. It's important therefore to actually wipe off the soot before you can assess how much burn injury has actually occurred. We can see on this picture that the patient has the typical crow's feet. These are the, where the eyes have closed shut and the wrinkles have ensured that that area has not got burnt. Still, always check the eyes with some fluorescent to make sure that there's no damage to the cornea. Flame burns often require burn services input. This is because the burn injuries are often deep and require surgical treatment. Electrical burns caused by domestic uh, electrical injuries are 240 volts in the UK. If a patient has had a normal ECG and there was no loss of consciousness, ongoing telemetry is usually not required. It's not always the case that there will be an exit wound and sometimes the damage to the skin can be quite small. It's very important, however, to assess muscle compartments because electrical injuries can cause compartment syndromes. We will consider chemical burns again later in the talk, but this is a typical alkali burn caused by cement. Let's now consider the depth of the burn. You may be familiar with the terms first, second and third degree. These are commonly used in the United States and worldwide. In Europe and in the UK, we usually break down the depth of the burn related to erythema, which is an epidermal burn, or that related to the dermis, which can be subdivided into a superficial dermal, mid-dermal, or deep dermal. A full thickness burn is one that is equivalent of a third degree burn. Let's now consider some examples of these burn injuries. Let's look at an example of an epidermal burn. Sunburn is a good example of this. Here we can see an example of a typical sunburn with very bright red skin. There may be no or minimal blistering, but it can be very painful. We would expect this to heal within a week. It's not unusual for burn services to have to admit at least a couple of patients every year related to sunburn. Superficial dermal burns can expect it to be painful. After the removal of blisters, the pink coloration in the skin tends to have a, a good capillary refill. As more of the dermis is damaged, this capillary refill becomes more sluggish, and the pink coloration tends to go to a deeper red. These type of burns are again very painful. Deeper dermal injuries tend to be a deeper red or white coloration. They still are painful, but the sensation tends to be a little bit less than in the more superficial dermal injuries. The capillary refill may be absent or may be slow. Full thickness burns 
often will have a white, black or charred appearance. This burn eschar can feel waxy or leathery to the touch. You would not expect to have any capillary refill. Remember, full thickness burns can still be painful, though the sensation on them tends to be decreased. Here we have a summary slide related to the burn depth, the healing time and the treatment. As you can see, simple creams are often all that is necessary for burns such as the sunburn. However, as we get deeper, we tend to use dressings or topical agents, which again can be creams. For deep dermal or full thickness injuries, though they can be left to heal with conservative treatment or dressings, the mainstay of treatment for these injuries is surgery. It's essential to visualize what the burn injury looks like. You can't do that if there is a large blister in the way. This patient, once the blister has been removed, we can see that healing has already started to begin. The management of blisters has been controversial over the years. But our network has produced a position statement on the management of blisters. Essentially, if it's larger than your thumb, we would recommend that the blister is de-roofed. We can see in these examples that these are large burn blisters. You'd be unable to fully assess what the burn injury depth was until the burn blister was removed. In addition, removal of the blisters allow you to decrease the risk of infection, provides more comfort for the patient as it relieves pressure. Blisters, particularly near a joint, may restrict the movement. And blister fluid contains uh, cytokines that may inhibit the healing process. To remove the blisters, you can clean the wound with some warm, warm water. Make sure that the patient has suitable analgesia. And then using sharp scissors and tweezers, remove the top of the blister. You should never puncture the blister and leave it intact as the dead skin will be a nidus for infection. This is our published advice with our Burn Care Network blister de-roofing guideline. If you wish to practice this in a non-burns patient, you can use some soft yellow paraffin, put a blob on your arm and cover it with an occlusive dressing. Then, using scissors and forceps, you can pretend that this is a blister and remove it. This is a quick clip of a video showing those techniques in practice.
Let's look at some specific considerations. Electrical injuries can cause a lot of damage beneath the axe skin surface. This may require more complex reconstructive techniques. Unless the area is very small or superficial, always involve your burns surface. Chemical injuries are commonly acids or alkalis. Though the pH of the skin varies slightly, acids are a pH of 0 to 6. They tend to be very painful and can cause deep damage. Alkalis likewise can often penetrate rather deeply. Here's an example of a number of chemical burns. Alkalis often cause a staining to the skin. We can see in the top left this typical staining. This makes difficulty in assessment of the depth of the burn. Below this is a forearm and hand of an acid injury. We can see that there's a frosting appearance and although the hair is still intact, the damage to the skin was below this level and this required a skin graft to heal the wound. The treatment of facial burns is usually with the application of some cream. Aloe vera is often very useful for this purpose as it contains anti-inflammatory properties. Any cream that is advised to be put on by the patients needs to be non-flammable if the patient is a smoker. Please always check if you're unsure. You can also see in this uh, photograph that the patient has a, an orange tinge around his eyes. This is because he has had fluorescin uh, to assess for corneal damage. In summary then, for facial burns, once removing any soot or debris from the skin, application with a, an appropriate gel or ointment uh, can be instigated. Advise the patients to sit up on a couple of pillows. This is important because you may get some swelling which happens over the next 24 to 48 hours. Check the eyes with some fluorescin to make sure that they haven't had any corneal damage. There are some areas of special concern and these should be discussed with your burn service. These include burns around the perineal region and those of the hands or feet. Even small burns to the feet have a high chance of getting infected if they are not strictly elevated. Please advise your patients to always elevate and keep off the feet as much as possible to try and prevent this. Please remember the burns are very painful. Always give age appropriate analgesia and also advise on analgesia to take home or to purchase from their pharmacy. Treatment of epidermal burns on the whole may be just a simple cream. A good tip is to put this in the fridge before application. If there are areas of blistering or fragility this may require a non-adherent dressing. It's really important that this is non-adherent. If gelinette or a similar type dressing is to be used, this should be a double layer. Remember these dry out quickly and so other dressings may be more appropriate, particularly if it was to be left on for longer, such as Mepitel or a border light. For injuries which are a little bit deeper, so for superficial to mid dermal burns, then a vast array of dressings and creams or ointments can be used. For specific areas such as fingers, and if it is a small area, hydrocolloids such as Comfield Plus or Geoderm are very useful. Otherwise, non-adherent dressings, particularly over areas that have been blistered de-roofed, are the most useful. Please be aware that anything that has silver uh, in the dressing or in the ointment will change the appearance of the wound. Deep dermal burns can be treated with dressings. However, the vast majority may require surgical intervention. There are special areas such as the palm of the hand with very specialist skin 
that we tend to treat conservatively in the first instance, unless they are clearly full thickness, to see how they will heal. These deep dermal burns may require an antimicrobial dressing. That is because the damage to the skin uh, provides a nidus for infection. Clearly this injury is full thickness. You can see the fat. These type of injuries, if small or if the patient is unfit for any surgical intervention, may require conservative treatment. However, the vast majority will require surgery. If in doubt, always seek advice from your burn service. The management of deep dermal and full thickness burns, if they are being treated with dressings, the principles are to prevent infection and to help the healing. This may require different dressings at different time points. Simple creams or ointments can either be left on for 24 hours up to a few days. Other dressings such as Acticote and Mepilex Silver often contain uh, the silver ions that are antimicrobial. Other agents such as honey also have antimicrobial properties. In summary, the choice of dressing may depend on both the type of burn and the area of the burn. What the patient can tolerate, do they want to shower each day? In which case a simple silver cream such as flamazine may be the treatment of choice. What's available to you? If it's a superficial burn, always make sure it's a non-adherent dressing. What's the cost effectiveness? And what's the access to healthcare for any dressing changes? If there are any concerns or any advice that you require, again, please contact the burn service. So what possible complications can occur with burns? The main thing to warn patients of is of signs of infection. So we're looking for redness outside the burn area, extending up the limb or extending outwards, bad smell or discharge coming from the dressing. If the patient is unwell or has a fever, then again, they should contact medical help. We do not normally advocate the use of oral antibiotics for burn injuries. If the burn is infected, then yes, antibiotics may be appropriate. A lot of creams and dressings do contain antimicrobial properties, and as such, it is not routine practice. You may have heard of the condition toxic shock syndrome. This is a potentially fatal disease. This is particularly in children under five. That's because they haven't developed the antibodies to strains of Staphylococcus, which cause toxin formation. As I say, it is very rare, but early recognition is important. If a child is unwell, feverish, listless, particularly if they've had a burn, and even small burns can cause this condition, it's vitally important that early treatment is sought. I'm now going to show a series of photographs. I'd like you to think about the questions above. I hope that you've enjoyed and found this training film useful. For further information, please see your local burn network guidance or the British Burns Association. Thank you for participating.